Welcome to our webinar titled Age Appropriate Behavior Management Strategies to Address Difficult Behaviors in Children with Neurologic Condition. My name is Cindy Wright and I'm a program manager for the Child Neurology Foundation and I'll be moderating the presentation today. Today's talk is part of our ongoing series, bringing together caregivers and health professionals to provide expert advice to the child neurology community. Each topic focuses on what we heard from our partners and our families as a top priority. We would like to thank our 2021 education series partners, Bluebird Bio, Greenwich Biosciences, Origin, and UCB. Today we're discussing age appropriate behavior management and we know that children with neurologic conditions have a greater incidence of challenging behaviors and that age matters when handling it. We know that traditional behavior management strategies with consequences and rewards often don't work and can sometimes make behaviors even worse. We know that caregivers need tools to address both the physical, emotional and intellectual age of their child. And we also know that there's a lot of books and theories out there on how to manage difficult behavior, but most focus on young neurotypical children. During today's session, we will hear from Eileen Naveen, sorry, Devine, who will share information on the Brain First Framework, Thinking Brain First and Then Behavior, through which your child's challenging behaviors are reduced and caregivers can shift toward greater connection and less frustration in parenting. We will also hear from Karen Kelly, who will share her experience with a brain first approach and the impact it has had on her entire family. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about today's speakers. Eileen has over a dozen years of clinical experiences and I think most importantly is the adoptive mother of a child with fetal alcohol syndrome. So she knows what we're going through. And she believes that kids do well if they can and that they, when we understand the way a child's brain works, we can then understand the meaning behind their challenging behaviors. Eileen has her master's in social work and is a certified facilitator in teaching the, an application of the neurobehavioral model. Karen is a single mother of three amazing children, a neurotypical son, age 11, and identical twin daughters, age eight, who have autism and ADHD. Karen has read every parenting book available and she's tried to navigate her daughter's challenging behaviors. She has a master's in counseling psychology and is the director of teen success and nonprofit organization in California, supporting the success of teen mothers and their children. Welcome to you both, and thank you for joining me today. We'll get started in just a minute. I just want to let you know that immediately following the presentation, there'll be a brief question and answer session. So please feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation by using the Q&A button on your control bar. Unfortunately, we'll not be able to answer all questions, but we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. Please keep your questions general in nature, Today's presenters will not be able to provide medical advice related to your specific situation. Thank you. And at this time, I will turn things over to Eileen. All right, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I um, am so thrilled to be here today to talk about what our challenging behaviors that we see in our child have to do with their brain function anyways. I know that um, when we talk about behavior management, already we're going right towards behavior modification, something that our society that is very comfortable with, the way that we were probably, many of us were raised is through a behavioral lens. The way we people view our child with challenging behaviors is through that behavioral lens. So I'm gonna ask you to shift that perspective today, hopefully um, at least piquing your interest in this model about looking, actually moving away from the challenging behavior and focusing much less on that and instead moving towards brain and how your unique child's brain works. So we, I always start with the neuroscience research so that folks can rest easy in this idea that it's not just someone coming in here and talking about some ideas they came up with. It really, this whole idea about thinking brain first in relation to our child's 
challenging behavior is rooted in neuroscience research. And once we understand that, which I'll talk about in just a moment, um, we then have a new way of seeing our child, right? The behaviors that are so incredibly challenging, we see, oh, now I get it. This is what's behind the behavior. It gives us some clarity. Our confidence builds in terms of feeling like we actually can do something about it when we've tried everything else and nothing's worked. Um, and just giving us a whole new way to view our child and how to help them settle. And that is when frustration is reduced for us as the parent, but also for our child. And over time, outcomes improve. So these are the, some, of, some of the questions that I feel like thinking brain first, this neurobehavioral lens um, helps us answer. What exactly does it mean for our child's challenging behaviors to be connected to their brain function? What if their brain and the way it, the unique way that it works is the source of all of those challenging behaviors. What does that mean for the way that I parent them? Why do very good parenting techniques fail miserably with my child? Give you a hint, it has to do with the way their brain works. <laughs> what if I always started from that standpoint that my child would do well if they could? How would that, even just starting from that standpoint every time we're met with a challenging behavior, how would that change the way that we proceed with them? What would change? And what if I didn't focus on the challenging behavior, but instead shifted my focus and focused on brain function and what's going on from that perspective with my child, what would change? So the brain first parenting approach, again, rooted in neuroscience research starts with the fact that there are many, many reasons why an individual's brain can be changed in function and structure. Research shows us that there's always all, over 40,000 different reasons that this can happen, which um, every time I say that statistic, it's amazing to me that any of us are considered neurotypical, right? So there's lots of reasons why the brain can be changed in function and structure. Um, physical changes to the brain impacts the way that it functions. That only makes sense. Behaviors are oftentimes the only symptoms. The brain and behaviors can never be separated. So this piece makes sense once you understand that and that that's something that neuroscience research has shown us again and again. It makes sense then that if a brain has been changed in um, its physicality, that we would see that through the behaviors, right? Because the two are always connected. What's tricky, and you all know this better than anyone, is that oftentimes, not all the time, but many times our kids look what society considers neurotypical, right? And so those behavioral symptoms, those challenging behaviors um, are misinterpreted, misunderstood, and they are incredibly vulnerable for misunderstanding, right? That connection isn't always clear to everybody else. When we can understand that and keep that at the forefront of our mind, which is hard work at times, then we can understand the source of that challenging behavior and actually do something to help them settle. Because the brain is a physical part of our body um, and it has been changed in function and structure, I consider it, this model considers it a physical disability. Anytime that our child has a neurobehavioral difference, it is a physical disability. And what would we do for any other child who has a physical disability? We would provide them with accommodations, right? So again, that logic there, most parents I find are like, oh, that makes sense. And they really... Um, want to see that actualized then in their parenting, that of course is the hard work, right? Taking it from theory and putting it into practice. But I'm gonna give you um, a few ways, show you just a few ways that we can, um, that you can start to do that. So brain-based differences are physical disabilities with challenging behavioral symptoms. Once we see those behaviors as something that's not just being done to us all the time, it's not willful defiance. Once we see it as it's our child saying, ah, this is not working for me. There's a poorness of fit here. I'm being misunderstood. My brain works so differently that even those very common cognitive skills that we all take for granted each day, we just do them all day throughout our day. Our child is saying, that's not where I'm at. My brain works so differently that that cognitive skill is very distressing for me. And so I have these challenging behaviors to show that, right? So that if we can understand like, ah, oh, this is where the poorness of fit is, our child's because of their physical disability, 
they're lagging behind in these very seemingly simple cognitive skills that are tripping them up all day long. So their frustration builds. And we see that in anxiety, we see that in um, violence, aggression, um, we see it as retreating, kind of they um, shut down, right? All of those are the symptoms that tell us something is not right, that we need to kind of look at that brain function piece and figure that out. Once we can see that connection and put those pieces together, then we're like, then we know what to do about it. We say, oh, okay, this is how I'm going to accommodate them for this physical disability. So this is the path to helping our child settle over time. Accommodations are just right and fair. We provide accommodations for any other child with a physical disability. Our children should be no different. Um, they are the treatment and the path to helping our child experience less challenging behaviors. So when we don't know what else to do, and also we're deeply entrenched in a behavioral lens, we do things like using our power and our control to try to make that behavior stop. Right. And I know in my own parenting experience and the parents I've worked with, that does not get us very far. <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't help that challenging behavior settle down. It just makes us feel more and more desperate and hopeless, like, oh my goodness, nothing will ever help my child settle. Accommodations takes us to a different root of the cause, right? Back away from that challenging behavior. Where's my child lagging in these cognitive skills? Let's support them around that. So they aren't so frustrated every single day, all day long. They're proactive and they're preventative. So it's really about putting in accommodations so that you don't see this escalation in behavior, right? Once your child is in the middle of that meltdown or that aggressive episode, there are things that you can do during that moment that are better than others. And we do talk about that, but the neurobehavioral model thinking brain first is all about doing work outside of the moment and putting strategies into place so that you can prevent that challenging behavior from ever happening, okay? So um, in the moment, we don't develop accommodations. We do that proactively, preventatively outside of the moment. It is not giving in. So we've all been in a situation, there's no shame or blame, we've all been there, where we do give in because we're tired and we're burnt out and we don't know what else to do, right? So um, again, there's no blame in that. I just wanna make sure the difference is really, really clear. Accommodations is recognizing that your child has a physical disability, which results in lagging cognitive skills. And because of that, they need to be supported differently, right? Um, it's based on their disability. So what do our brains do for us every day? everything, every behavior that we carry out is connected to our brain function. And so when I talk with parents about this and we talk like every single behavior is connected to brain function, it can be quite overwhelming. It's like, well, how do I make sense of that for my child, right? So there are ways to do that. It's a, it's a, it's a learning curve, but you're all capable of getting up over that learning curve. And we look at things like sensory um, sensory, managing sensory input and um, whether your child can ignore it, how they um, respond to environments with lots of sensory input. Things like hunger cues, can they manage their own hunger cues as a child, their chronological age would it be expected to. Things like language and communication or memory and processing, all of those types of things are things that we take for granted every single day. We have the luxury of doing that. Our child does not, right? So when we see, okay, my child, for example, following two or three step verbal instructions, many of our kids have very slow processing speed and they can only do one step at a time, even in ages 12, 13, 14. And that's not because, oh, I give them two or three steps and they just choose not to. That's the behavioral lens. It's, mm, I wonder, I wonder if they have slow verbal processing, a 10 second child in a one second world. And if I gave them one thing at a time, they could actually hold on to that one direction at a time versus the two or three steps, right? So my daughter is um, 12. And as Cindy mentioned, she has fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. She has significant behavioral symptoms at times. And the way that I describe her to others who are managing the environments that she's in, so like teachers, for example, is she's a really good listener and she wants to do the right thing, but she has very slow verbal processing and you can only give her one step at a time. That's very, very different than she never listens. 
and she'll never follow instructions. She only does, does what she wants to do, right? That's not true. She would do well if she could. If they give her too many instructions <laughs> and don't give her time to process it, then it will look as though she is defiant. She's not, right? It all has to do with her physical disability, her lagging skills. So things like social cues, um, inhibiting impulses, so this piece is really, really important when we think about age appropriate behavior management, right? So our child is a chronological age, whatever that is, there are societal expectations that come with that chronological age. If we continue to take those, all of those kind of pieces of information that we get about this is what a child should be doing at this age and then punish them or consequence them or just even respond to them accordingly, our children will continue to fail. Because what research shows us is that kids who have neurobehavioral conditions are younger in so many of these skills, not just socially and emotionally, we'll talk about that in a minute, but in, for example, the ability to organize their day, executive functioning skills, the ability to manage frustration, the ability to take somebody else's perspective, a child of a very, very young age, we don't expect them to have that skill in place yet. We teach that to them, right? Think about the way that you, that you work with three-year-olds, right? They're very self-focused. They have very little impulse control. They aren't very good at sharing and compromising. <laughs> and we know that. It's not distressing to us as parents. We work with them because we know they're building that skill. What if you have a child who's eight, nine, 10, even older, that's still working on that cognitive skill? What then? punishing them for the behavior that you see as a result of that is not going to help them build that skill, right? So the management of the behavior is actually to recognize the behavior as a symptom and understand what cognitive skill is behind it so that you can do something about it that way. Because from just the amount of time that we have, we can't dive deep into all of these cognitive skills, right? We could literally be talking all day about those. Um, I wanted to highlight just a few that I think, that I thought would be especially helpful to you just based on the work that I do with parents. So looking at our child's very fragile nervous system. So the brain is a part of the nervous system. When I see my child kind of falling apart and having a really, really tough time, again, challenging behaviors, but what I see it as, oh, this is her fragile nervous system showing itself to me, right? And I, I'm based on your child's um, diagnosis, if they have a neurobehavioral difference, I think it is a safe assumption for you to make as well, that they have a very fragile nervous system. And so what that means is their window of tolerance for strong emotions, for things not going their way, for frustrations, is going to be very, very narrow. So if a typical child, a neurotypical child, if their window of tolerance is like this and they get frustrated, they kind of go up and down with it, right? Like, oh, I'm so frustrated. I don't agree with you. I don't like that. But they never just lose it where they are then unraveling for hours and we're trying to get them back, right? For our kids with neurobehavioral differences, their frustration, their window of tolerance for frustration and strong emotions is like this. And so you um, say something, something can't go their way. Um, and they have very little cognitive flexibility, all executive functioning skills. And so then they're, they flip their lid, right? And you're like, where did that come from, right? Zero to 60. What happens when they flip their lid is they're out of their thinking brain. So most of us in a traditional parenting sense would say, hey, that wasn't okay. Come down and sit here. We're going to talk about this, right? We address it in the moment. Even if we're calm, even if we're talking very calmly and not raising our voice, the thing I want you to remember is that if their thinking brain is not online, they can't reason with you. They can't verbally process. They can't do all of those other cognitive skills that it takes to be able to have that conversation with you, right? And so knowing that in that moment, what they need, their fragile nervous system needs you to help them co-regulate, help them come back down. And that's, of course, we could talk for a whole another hour about what that is, what's involved in that. Um, helping them come down so their thinking brain can come online and you can then later talk to them about what happened. Sometimes it's the next day, sometimes it's the next week, right? That's how our kids are wired. But sometimes it takes them that long to be able to then tolerate having that conversation. But your energy will be so much better spent if you can remember these executive functioning skills, 
cognitive flexibility, frustration tolerance, handling big emotions. It's not about your child's character. It's about the fact that they do, their window of tolerance is narrow. That's executive functioning. All right, so I mentioned the chronological age and how it looks really different for our kiddos who have brain-based differences um, in terms of what we can expect from them at that chronological age. What research shows us is that kids who have neurobehavioral differences are a different age developmentally in many, many areas. And so again, they can look neurotypical and people expect them to act their age, but what if they are a different age developmentally in all of those different cognitive skills areas that I mentioned? What does that mean for the way that we parent them? I've never worked with a parent, with a family, where this has not been present for their child. It can vary, right? It can be as much as half their age developmentally, so quite pronounced, um, but even just a few years younger at some age ranges is a big, big difference, right? So this is how it typically works. If you have a 16 year old, as an example, what if their social and emotional age is more like that of an eight year old? How does that then mean that you respond to them in that moment? How does that mean they, what does it mean for their experience of the world, right? 16 is a super tricky age, we all know that. What can you imagine an eight-year-old trying to navigate a 16-year-old's world and all the additional support they would need to be able to do that successfully? Um, but our kids have strengths, right? So they excel in some areas, which really clouds the picture for some adults who are trying to wrap their mind around like, what is going on here, right? That you have a child who is acting so young, but yet they excel in this one area. That uneven development makes people... Uh, um, easy, <laughs> right? They don't have any lens to see that through. The expressive language as well can at times be on par with their peers. That's not uncommon. It's not always the case, but it's not uncommon. But what if that expressive language doesn't match up with the receptive language, the way they receive information, right? So all of this is about understanding how your unique child experiences the world from this brain-based cognitive skill standpoint. So then you can figure out like, oh, this is where, this is what's getting in the way every single day, all day for them. No wonder they're chronically frustrated and I'm seeing these challenging behaviors as a result. Okay, so this dismaturity, it's foundational to our understanding of our kids and carries across all the other cognitive skills. So steps that you can take now, disengage, stop fighting, right? Stop going, trying to at the behavior and kind of up in the ante, right? Getting locked in those conflicts where it just then you're both kind of at a place that um, it's hard to come back down from. Take a step back, think brain, what could be going on here? If my child would do well if they could, what might be getting in their way? focused on regulation and connection first. If you don't have those two pieces in place, you're gonna have a really, really hard time moving forward. We're so, as parents, we so much want to get to like, I need to teach them that wasn't okay. Yes, you do, that's part of parenting. And also they can't do it if they're dysregulated. And if you have no connection with them, those pieces have to be in place first. Asking what if, and what in, when in doubt, assume the brain, right? What if this had to do with their lagging cognitive skills? What if this wasn't about willful, you know, intentional defiance and manipulation? What if, what would I do differently? Ask what age does this remind me of? And then that age that comes to mind, how would you support a child of that age in this particular situation? Use that as a starting point. And then adjusting expectations to be more in line with your child's cognitive skills. We need to have expectations for our kids, right? That's our job as parents, but making sure that it's in line with where they are from their cognitive skills standpoint. All right, now I'm gonna hand it over to Karen. Thank you, Eileen. Um, very happy to be here with you all today to share my experience as a parent using, well, first not using this approach <laughs> and then using this approach, um, which of course is still a work in progress. 
as Cindy mentioned, I'm a single mom of three um, very spirited kids. Um, my son is 11 and is neurotypical, and I have identical twin daughters who are eight years old, about eight and a half now, and they have been diagnosed, as Cindy also mentioned, with autism, ADHD, and what she didn't mention, which I just want to throw out there because I think this is important, um, is they've also been diagnosed with ODD or oppositional defiant disorder, which I consider a nothing diagnosis because it's very, it's a very behavioral based diagnosis. And so I wanted to, to make sure that got in there. So my girl's behavior has always been challenging um, and has become increasingly so with age. As babies, they were always needing to be held and engaged. Um, otherwise they were crying or screaming. As they became toddlers, they were climbing and throwing and hitting and you know eating things they shouldn't have been eating. And a lot of risk-taking behaviors that, con that continued as they became preschoolers um, and some added behaviors there were you know, running away in public places, climbing things with absolutely no ability to get down. One time, one of my daughters jumped in a swimming pool and she did not know how to swim and she had no floaties on. She just jumped right in. Um, and slowly they moved into what I used to call uh, defiant behavior. And that grew increasingly unsafe, mean, destructive, and violent. Um, everything was a battle and every interaction had me on edge. I was constantly waiting for the other shoe to drop, which is not a fun way to live. Um, early on, I realized that something wasn't quite right, or at least my gut told me that there was something wasn't quite right. Um, I did read literally every parenting book I could find. Um, a parenting pro approach uh, that focused on connection was, was really always my go-to. However, I found that as my girls got older and their behaviors got more challenging, it was really hard to maintain that approach um, because I was trying desperately to make them better, teach them how to be good um, so that life wasn't so hard, uh, trying to figure out how to make life less hard. And as suggested by numerous experts along the way, I tried a myriad of approaches that focused on changing their behaviors through rewards and punishments or consequences. Some would work for a moment, um, but eventually they all failed. And most often they escalated their challenging behaviors. So one of the things I also wanna share because I also think this is important for folks with young children um, or folks working with uh, parents with young children is that you know, again, I knew something wasn't quite right in my gut early on, but my girls were really smart, very verbal, and looked normal, quote unquote. Um, and so nobody really would listen to me when I said, oh, I don't know what's going on. Something doesn't seem right. And they would say things like, oh, they're just strong willed or, you know, you know, suggest give me lots of parenting advice. And so what I started doing is blaming myself. I wasn't a good enough parent you know, what in the world was I doing wrong? Why couldn't I parent them? What's wrong with me? And that, you know, is not where we want to be as parents. Um, when my girls got kicked out of preschool at age four for defiant behavior, we finally began the journey towards answers. Um, finally, we had to do something. Somebody had to help us. <laughs> they were diagnosed with ADHD at five and autism and ODD also at age six. And, and I think there was you know, a lot surrounding those diagnoses in terms of um, emotions and feelings of relief and, oh my gosh, what does this mean for them and for us? Um, but it still didn't it still didn't lead to answers necessarily. It led to a lot more questions. Um, and the combination of their diagnoses was tricky. And so, you know, most of the supports that were wrapped around us focused on ADHD or autism, not their brains, but the behaviors or the needs ah. to ADHD or autism. And that did not help us. So now we had diagnoses, but again, still no clear answers on how to help them. So about a year later, 
after continuing to read every book I could find, I was introduced to the neurobehavioral approach. And it just made so much sense. Um, so as I continued to read and research, and I found Eileen, <laughs> and um, thanks to her coaching and my continued sort of educating myself around this model, I began to really understand just what Eileen was sharing, that lagging skills was behind their bad behavior or, or their difficult behavior. And that um, their behavior was not willful. I may think that sort of kids do well when they can, that shift in how I thought about my girls was critical. Um, it was a hard and long shift. I did, it did not happen overnight. And, but once it shifted, I just began to see them differently. And then I could start to do the work that needed to be done mostly on me in changing how I interacted with them. I also started to see that they were, as Eileen also shared, um, developmentally not their chronological age, socially, emotionally in particular. So, so much of their social emotional behaviors and responses were more like three or four year olds. Um, and so again, I was able to really take a look at, okay, what do I, what would I do with a three or four year old who is exhibiting these behaviors? So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples of some of their behaviors and how, how I shifted, how I saw them. So they have no ability to wait. And their go-to um, when they have to wait for anything, even for 30 seconds, is to scream or get aggressive. They don't wanna wait, they want what they want and they want it now. So what I used to view this as, as they're incredibly impatient and entitled. And now, I see it as they have no ability to tolerate frustration. They cannot tolerate any level of frustration. And so that, that behavior of screaming and aggression is an expression of that. Another example is that they can be incredibly mean to each other, which is an interesting dynamic for twins, <laughs> um, but they can really be pretty, pretty aggressive and violent with each other at times. And sometimes other people as well. And I used to see this as they just don't care about people. They don't have empathy. You probably hear that a lot. You know, you just, they lack empathy. And I mean, I said that many, many times. And now I see this simply as an inability, not simply, but certainly as an inability to put themselves in other people's shoes or take other people's perspectives. Their brain is not able to do that. Um, one more thing that's a, is, is much more of a common uh, occurrence in our house is that they often explode when plans change or what they thought or they wanted to happen doesn't. So again, as, what I, as I used to see this as willful defiance, um, I now see that they have a really hard time handling transition, change, and ambiguity. So sort of learning these things, honestly, the, the model and the approach was the easy part for me. What has been hard and continues to be hard, and it's a journey, certainly not a destination, is how I interact with them and how I respond to them. Um, and so it's kind of funny how what it really has come down to is changing me, not them. <laughs> um, there are a number of things I've had to change. Um, and so, you know, clearly I've had to do some work on um, my triggers, which are, are many um, with them and their behavior and really identify what those triggers are and be able to um, develop the skills to, um, uh, to not be, I'm still triggered. Those triggers have not gone away necessarily, but not be reactive to really step back and my mantra is they would, they, 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 my girls will do well if they can, you know, this is their brain, this isn't them. Like I have these mantras that I've get, you know, uh, taught myself to um, help my, help me step back and pause and think. <laughs> um, and again, work in progress, um, but that has been critical. And understanding my triggers has been critical and developing the skills, as I just mentioned, to sort of pausing and not reacting to them has also been critical. Um, I think another really important point is that connection before correction, 
that's, I can't remember who's, I stole that from somebody. I don't remember who, um, but that is so critically important because, uh, it, and I've seen it in action when I can pause and put my hand on their back or make eye contact or do some level of connection when they're losing it, um, it leads to a de-escalated behavior. When I get mad or impatient or yell or disengage, their behavior escalates. Um, and as Eileen also mentioned, you know, their thinking brain is offline. And so I can't correct them in that moment. It does not work. It just escalates their behavior. So I have to get them to a calm place. And sometimes I don't even have the conversation about what just happened after they've calmed. Sometimes I'll circle back around hours later or even the next day, depending on how you know, emotionally charged uh, things were. And I've had, to, I've had to do that work of preparing in advance, um, of really making sure that I do my best to plan ahead and be ready for just about everything, which of course is not entirely possible because life happens. Um, but as much as I'm able to do that, um, I try. You know, for our family, reducing the outbursts and challenging moments is key because not only do those impact me and my daughters, they impact my son. Um, and the stress in our life has been so high in the past, reducing those outbursts and challenging moments um, is really a primary goal for us and for me. So an example, if we're going to the beach, at which we do a lot, and there may be traffic, which there is a lot, um, I talk with them in advance about it and say, okay, remember, we might hit traffic. You know, what can we do in the car if we do hit traffic to make the time go faster? Because remember, they have zero patience. Even driving 30 minutes to the beach is incruciatingly difficult for them. Um, so we have to plan for that. You know, we have, we have our activities that we normally do in the car, but if we get stuck in traffic, all right, what are we going to add on to that? And we talk about it and make up things together and make sure that we have those tools. Um, another example, on bath day, I do a lot of reminders. I remind them in the morning um, before school. And then again, when I pick them up from school and if they refuse at night, which is, you know, they have a lot of sensory challenges. So, so showers are challenging. If they refuse to take one, I say, okay, we won't do it tonight. Let's plan for tomorrow. When do you want to take a shower tomorrow? Um, and so there's a lot of, of just sort of adjusting, um, things as we go to flexibility for me is critically important um, in order to help them remain calm. Um, I think the letting go of expectations is, is really important. I've said a lot of things are really important because they are, but certainly letting go of expectations are. I, that's been a hard journey for me. It continues to be a hard journey, but I've had to. Um, not just ex expectations, but uh, um, expectations of them, but expectations of our family in general, what our family life will look like, um, you know, that we won't be able to go, uh, you know, to out to a nice restaurant. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that I thought we would be doing as a family that we're just not going to be doing. Um, and I've had to let go of that and just come to an acceptance of this is us, this is who we are. And, um, um, and, you know, find ways to, to enjoy that. The other thing I've had to definitely uh, adjust to or accept is that I am their co-regulator. Um, their neediness is incredibly hard for me. It is, can be constant and very overwhelming for me at times. And I've had to learn to accept that that is my role, um, not just as their parent, but that is my role as a human for them that I am their co-regulator. And when I can co-regulate with them and connect with them, we are good for the most part. Um, I can de-escalate them fairly quickly. We can move on quickly from challenging moments. Um, and so that is critically, that's been an important piece for me in terms of accepting of that. Um, I really am challenged by it continuously, but I've had to learn to, to manage that and embrace it. Um, so 
and I mentioned this already, but I just, I want to make sure it's really clear that, you know, we are a work in progress. We haven't gotten there. Um, I don't think there is there a there to get to. <laughs> I think there is, it, this is an ongoing process of learning. Um, and as they get older, there's new challenges that arise that we have to learn about together. And um, so I'm constantly learning and adjusting and, um, you know, adjusting my expectations, adjusting how I parent, all of those things. But I do want to be clear that we have come a long way. You know, we used to have probably four to five times a day, there were meltdowns or angry outbursts um, or violent outbursts from one of them, um, you know, kind of throughout the whole day. And it was exhausting and overwhelming. And now we're probably down to maybe one a week, um, sometimes more than that, depending on the week, but they're shorter, um, they're less violent. Um, and we have way more sort of sweet, funny family moments together, which is, you know, of course, what every family wants. I also just really quickly want to touch on our educational journey, because I think it's really important that we all understand that, um, so my girls have been at least pre-pandemic in regular public school classrooms with services and accommodations around them. And we have been very fortunate to have amazing teachers who have been willing to listen to me and try out any idea I have or any, um, uh, you know, really see me as an expert in, in my girls, which has been amazing. But the bottom line is that public education, this public education is deeply ingrained in the behavioral approach or, or lens. Um, and as a parent, I've, you know, I've even in their, with their amazing teachers, I've had to, you know, continuously say things like, but they don't have the skills to do what you're expecting them to do. So no amount of stickers or, you know, rewards is going to get them to be able to do that. Um, it's a brain issue. So I, I just, ha you know, I say that a lot in a lot of settings um, in the educational system. And it can be extremely exhausting, but I think it's important um, that you know they spend so much time at school that it's that it's in incredibly necessary to to support educators um, because they want what's best for our, our, our kids too, right? And so certainly my my children's teachers have been that way um, to help them really see through this lens as well. Um, it's kind of on us, or it has been on me as a parent to do that. And I think I will pause there. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, Eileen. So great. Um, I, I know that um, talks like this always give me a hope. I'm working on this in our household and we are seeing improvements. Um, so I can also say that it works, but I have a long way to go. Um, so lots of great questions and I'm super excited because we have some school staff here and they're asking great questions. Um, one, it, well, they want to know how, there's a lot of parents and teachers want to know how to get this information out to schools and to engage teachers and IEP teams. So I imagine you both have, Karen, you talked about it a little bit, but we want to take that one first. Do you, do you, Karen, do you want to speak to that? Sure. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so, you know, I think there is so much that needs to be done in that area. And I know, and Eileen probably has um, uh, much more of a, of a uh, understanding of the resources that are available out there. But I do think there's a very strong need. And it's not just in education. It's also in the, the healthcare community. Um, you know, we have providers all over the place who are very behaviorally focused. Um, so I, I, I think, but I do think there are um, folks working on this across the country. Um, so maybe Eileen, you can share a bit more. Yeah, so I mean, I do, I do think the way that I think about, um, you know, when I talk to parents about the struggles that they're having at schools with educators coming around, I say, well, is it possible that they're missing information just like you were at one point about <laughs> how to shift this lens? Nobody teaches us this. And so we don't just come to it on our own, right, unfortunately. And so one conversation at a time, 
um, is one piece, which can be very laborious for the parents involved. And so for the teachers and the educators, if you can start from that perspective too, that this child would do well if they could, and if they are disrupting your classroom every moment of every day, there's something else going on there. They don't wanna be in trouble. They don't wanna stand out in that way you know, with their peers and that the parent is highly distressed about the behavior too. It's so rare for these parents to hear from somebody, I know that your child's good. I know your child is a tender hearted child that wants to do well. Even just that can really change the dynamic and the conversation. In terms of resources, um, you know, Dr. Ross Green is a great go-to. Um, there's things about the collaborative, collaborative problem solving model. Lost at School is one of his books about schools um, specifically. There's pieces about that um, that line up perfectly with the neurobehavioral model and I love his work. Um, one of the things that the onus is on the parent like Karen <laughs> talked about and I've certainly experienced in my own parenting, it really is about us as adults changing so that we can accommodate this child. This child is who they are. Their brain works the way that it works, right? They really actually don't need to change. What needs to change is our support of them and the recognition of what's hard for them so that those challenging behaviors settle, right? So coming at it from that starting perspective can really change the course of the entire conversation. Um, another uh, comment that just came in is that this approach works really well for neurotypical kids as well. And um, Karen, I know we've talked before that it's helped your son. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's definitely all kids. We all have talent. Adults have it. I might use it on my husband. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Yeah, it really is about being in human relationships and understanding that we're all somewhere different on that neurodiversity spectrum, right? Um, and yeah, I mean, Karen mentioned her son who's neurotypical. I have a 13 year old who's neurotypical. It works really, really well for him as well. So yeah, it's a great way to just understand humans. <laughs> It's also a great teaching tool for those neurotypical kids too, to help them. You know, my son has learned a lot in terms of, you know, why his sisters act the way they do um, through this model. Um, you know, he's still, he's still embracing it slowly, <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it's really a great tool to help siblings of kids who have challenging behaviors as well. All right. Um, I'll ask this real quick. Uh, so some people are asking if Ross Green has a certification for teachers in schools. I mean, I know you do classes as well. Yeah, so, you know, I don't know, you'd have to, Lives in the Balance is his website, his nonprofit. Um, they do do trainings um, periodically. I don't know about specifically for educators, but um, it's a great, that whole website has, is just so full of resources. So absolutely check it out. Um, and then, yeah, I also do, um, nine hour training programs for professionals and parents and train teachers when they ask you to that sort of thing as well. But yeah, either, either what resource would be great in terms of learning how to take this theory and then actually put it into practice. <laughs> that is where the hard work is. <laughs> um, what does it look like to disengage? Does that mean walking away, ignore the behavior, act like it's not happening? How do you do that? Hmm. Karen, do you want to talk about what it looks like for you? <laughs> it's, so disengaging actually escalates my girl's behavior, um, which is my, you know, is the thing that I used to do a lot because I would get overwhelmed and I would shut down, right? So I'm in fight or flight and I clearly, I'm not going to, you know, beat up, beat them up. So I'm going to flee. <laughs> um, and and they come out, they would come after me. I mean, it just, they, they, you know, basically what they were telling me with their, like, you know, their behavior escalating and they would, if I tried to go into the bathroom to, you know, calm down, they would be, you know, following me. Or if I lock the door, they'd be banging on the door. Um, what they're telling me is I need you. And now they actually can verbalize this, but when they were younger, I need you to help me calm down. I need, you know, they're telling me, don't leave me. Um, don't walk away. I need you to help me calm down. So my, so I can't disengage. Um, sometimes I still do because I'm completely overwhelmed, but now I just sort of stay in the space with them and don't say anything and deep breathe until I'm in a place where I'm like, okay, <laughs> um, you know, I'm calmer and can help them co-regulate, but just for my girls. And I think this is probably true for a lot of kids. Um, uh, it, it escalates their behavior. 
Yeah, and you bring up such a good point, Karen, I should probably change that word too, because I think that is what we think of is to like exit physically, exit the situation. And sometimes that is what kids need, but I, I would agree with you 100% that most of these kids, because their nervous system is fragile, and it needs that physiological buffer, that co-regulation with a regulated adult, that if we, if we leave, we're taking that with us, right? And so they need us to be there and be present to have that physiological process take place. And so in disengage, the way that I would encourage you all to think about it is to not engage in the conflict, right? And so Karen did a beautiful job of, of um, of talking about what she does, she stays present. She doesn't physically disengage, she stays present, but she is not um, engaging with them in the conflict and like upping the ante and getting things more heated in her household, right? She's very aware of what she's doing in the moment to calm herself and aware of the need of her daughter. That is the work, to be able to stay grounded in our own body <laughs> and say, this is, this is what I need to do to keep myself sane in this moment because my kids, have to have me here and present for that co-regulation. So, yeah. Uh, we have a question about what do you suggest for significant transition issues? So that's a great question. I like the question because we've identified what the cognitive skill is, right? It's not my child refuses to get in the car, my child, whatever. It's, wow, they have a really difficult time with transitions and that's an executive functioning skill. So how can I accommodate that? Um, it's going to look different for all kids, right? And so that's why some parents, when they come to me, it's like, they, they say, can't you just give me a list of strategies for like transitions? And I say, I could, but they might not work for your unique child, right? And so that's why this is proactive, thoughtful process taking place outside of the moment, not in the midst of that transition. And so it could be, it could mean like, I mean, like Karen talked about, a lot of these kids cannot see what's coming next, even when it's the same routine over and over and over again. How overwhelmed would we be if we couldn't see what was coming next? And so is that it? Is that it for your child? Is that part of the anxiety around the transition? Right? So it could mean all kinds of different things. I don't know, Karen, if you have some go-to strategies that you use. Yeah. And I have to say it's been, it's, you know, I, I, it's been trial and error because um, it actually is slightly different from both of my girls, but the one who has the most trouble with transition, I have to, like, if I know it's coming, which I usually do, right. Especially the large transitions, you know, there's weeks of preparation. And so, you know, Eileen just helped us through a transition into a new school, which took a month <laughs> of, you know, of helping them be okay with it, especially one of my daughters. Um, and it was a lot of like talking about it and what are your concerns and, and let's try it. And, um, you know, so talking to them in advance about it's coming helps them process the anxiety before it happens um, or process whatever is going on for them before it happens. Smaller transitions, um, uh, you know, are similar though. I try to as much as possible in advance say today, like today, somebody else pick, is picking them up from school. So I let them know last night um, and they forgot this morning and I let them know this morning and there was a big, ah, that's not okay. I'm not. And so when I drop them off, I'm like, remember, you know, so there's a lot of sort of um, reminders about it. Yeah, I think this is a really good example too of, um, why those traditional very good parenting techniques don't always work. When I think of transitions, for example, a child is on an iPad <laughs> and they need to get off, right? And you say, you've got 15 minutes, you've got 10 minutes, you've got five minutes, like worked wonderfully for my neurotypical son, still does. He can understand the concept of time. 15 minutes versus five minutes means something to him. Like he knows the difference between those two. My daughter who's 12 has a very difficult time thinking abstractly, really concretely making sense of what those time frames mean. She can't do it. And so I say 15 minutes, it could be three hours in her mind, right? And so when I come to say like your 15 minutes is up, it's as though I'm springing it on her and she's upset. I've taken her by surprise. I haven't given her any time to transition, even though in my mind I did, right? And so again, looking at is it about the executive functioning transitioning? Yes, but is it about abstract thinking skills too? Is it about verbal processing? 
that we ask them to transition with verbal instructions all the time, right? Hey, come here, come upstairs and do this, do that, do this. What if they have slow verbal processing? What if they can't hold on to it and then put it into action? What if, I mean, that's that what, what if question, right? And so I love what Karen has said about it's trial and error, right? It's figuring out as best you can what's behind the behavior, trying the accommodations and then refining that saying like, okay, that worked really well or okay, it kind of worked but there wasn't something that was quite right. Like maybe I could do this differently. Uh, we have another question about what to do with children who are cognitively impaired, um, both emotionally and developmentally um, to a toddler age. What is the best approach for dealing with tantrums? Do you take the ABA approach? Do you treat them like toddlers? Mm -hmm. um, so, I'll, I'll, I'll talk for a minute and then Karen, if you have anything else to add. Um, I think that's very common that our child can experience that much regression, especially when they are overwhelmed by emotion or frustration, right? Um, so just wanna say that. And ABA therapy is about as far away from this model as you can get. This model goes the complete opposite direction in my mind of ABA therapy. Um, the other piece is if they are a different age developmentally, they're not just acting like a baby. They are a different age developmentally because of their physical disability. Then we approach them like the needs of the child at the age they are, right? And so that's really tough for some parents. It's like you're seeing this 10 year old right in front of you who looks like a 10 year old but the behavior is that of a toddler, the impulse control, the frustration tolerance, the very self-focused, you know, all of those very normal toddler behaviors. For us to be able to shift ourselves and say, okay, this is what they need. This is what they need from me. And to be okay with giving them what they need, even though it's so different than the lens that we have been, that we've been taught, that we were parented by, right? That's where the work is. So I don't know, Karen, if you have anything else. There. Yeah. I mean, I think that's exactly it. I mean, one of my daughters, um, when she gets overwhelmed, uh, or her frustration gets to a level, she starts just flinging whatever's in front of her. Like it's, it reminds me of a toddler <laughs> and I'm like, she's just throwing stuff. If it's food, if whatever's in front of her, she's throwing it. And I used to just be like, please stop throwing things, <laughs> which is what I, you would do with an eight-year-old, right? Like, it's not okay to throw things, <laughs> please stop, you know? Um, and now I just walk over and put my hand on her, you know? So it's very, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, she's a toddler. She has no ability to calm herself down right now. Um, she is reacting completely. And so I need to physically help her calm down. So I walk over, put my hand on her. Sometimes she'll reject that, but oftentimes and I'll just rub her back um, while she's calming herself down. And then later we talk about how please don't throw things that are glass because they might hurt the dog or, you know, things like that. <laughs> yeah. And that's a really important point. I think that Karen made that I want to highlight that this way of parenting is not an excuse for inappropriate behavior. Our role as parents is to help grow those skills in our kids to understand their impact on others, cause and effect, what might happen, you know? Um, we can't do it in the moment. We need to give them what they need in the moment to come to that regulated place. And this circling back that Karen's talking about is the, is the way that we then get to take all our parental wisdom <laughs> and share it with them in a way that in, in a time when they can actually receive it. Uh, there's a couple questions about what to do um, when like you try not to listen to what other people have to say and just focus on your child but are there tips because it's it's not easy when someone in the grocery store or a teacher or a parent grandparent is judging you and your child how do you guys address that my my um blood pressure just went up when you were talking about grandparents and people in grocery stores um I've gotten so much of it because, you know, my girls have, especially when they were young, just had some really horrendous behavior in public. Um, and, you know, we got to a point where we just wouldn't take them anywhere for a while, but I was like, no, <laughs> they need to be in public. It's not, you know, so I just, um, I just ignore it. I mean, I, I've just gotten to, a, you know, you know, smile and ignore it um, with people who, are, who don't know, you know, in public. 
with par- I, so I did, when I learned about this approach, I sent um, Ross Green's book to every single one of my family members and friends. And I said, if you ever want to see us again, <laughs> you have to read this. So you really understand my girls. Um, and every single person who is still in my life read it um, and has a much better. And so now I can say when my mom says something that's very behaviorally you know, focused, I can say, remember in Ross's Green's book, blah, 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 blah. And she's like, oh, right. Yeah. Right. So I have that because I, um, it's, it's really hard though. I mean, it's, you know, I questioned my parenting, as I mentioned for a really long time, because, um, because of their behavior, it was a reflection on me. I know differently now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that, um, I mean, echoing what Karen has said that, um, understanding that people are missing information that you once were, I try to really start from that perspective and helping them reframe my child's behaviors from a a behavior lens to a neurobehavior lens in the moment as I'm able to. But then also understanding that there's going to be some people who aren't capable of this shift. That was super disappointing to me (laughs) to realize that. And my mentor helped me kind of grow into acceptance of that. There's some people who cannot make the shift. And so then you need to protect your kids and you need to protect your own energy and not go down that path anymore of trying to convince them that something's wrong with your child. Um, And so that's a delicate balance too, right? And there's a lot of sadness and loss and grief with that. It's not easy, Um, but understanding that your your resilience and your energy and literally your life, your wellness depends on you being able to do that and set those boundaries. Great. Um, Well, we are out of time, sadly. There was a lot of more questions that I couldn't get into. Where? Where do you recommend parents can go to get more information? I mean, maybe your website or? Yeah, so my website is just my name.com, <laughs> eileendevine.com. There's a lot of blog posts there that, um, you know, I hope you'll, you'll check out related to this topic on all different aspects of this topic. Um, so that's one, one place. And then um, I already mentioned um, Lives in the Balance is another really great website with lots and lots of great resources. Thank you. Well, with that, sadly, we have to end, but on behalf of the Child Neurology Foundation and our partners, I want to thank each of you for joining us today. We hope you found the information helpful. Uh, We'll be posting this event online next week, and we'll email everyone a link to the recording. And hopefully, if you're still on, you can take a moment to complete the survey that'll pop up when we end the webinar. Thank you, and have a lovely day. Bye, Aileen. Bye. Bye. Take care. Thank you.